Well, it's already been a joyous morning, hasn't it? Come on in. And uh, uh, a couple things I would note, it was great just to worship together uh, this morning, wasn't it? And I wanted to say to you that um, as I sit up front, they really sing, don't they, Tom? Um, It is just, I was just listening as you were singing and uh, I was just praising the Lord for that. So I know many of you are from countryside and some of you are guests from other places, but it was just real apparent and a real blessing just to be in worship with you guys and with Seth and the worship team. And uh, I, I praise the Lord for that. And I'd also just like to say, Ken, I told Ken uh, just here in between the hours, you know, I spend part of my life Uh, preaching, as all of us do, and then I spend another part of my life training preachers at the Master's Seminary. We have both a class that goes to that instruction and then a laboratory that goes to that instruction. In fact, I think the Master's Seminary is a little bit unique because um, in, in the spring class that I teach where it's really the the nuts and bolts of how to make a sermon. I let the guys preach a couple times in there, two times in that spring semester. And then when they get to the, the fall, they preach seven times. So in the course of a year, one year, they're preaching about nine times, which I would have to think is probably as much preaching as uh, they will get in instruction at any seminary in America. So I'm thankful for that, but I think it was a joy this morning, I say that to say, to hear that message on listening and hearing the Word of God. And I think if we can keep both of those elements going, because I encourage our men to never be boring with the Word of God. And uh, what a joy it was to hear how to listen and the truth that is given to that. So Ken, thank you for that time and a needed subject. And you're right, there's many resources on preaching but few on listening, and we spend a lot of our time listening. I think I was kind of convicted in there because you gave one message from 10 to 75, 3,000, two messages from 10 to 75 is about 6,000, and I thought, man, I've heard so many more than that, and uh, I'm doubly convicted, you know, and uh, had the joy, even as a little boy, growing up at Grace Community Church here in MacArthur. So there is a far greater accountability when that's the case. But I praise the Lord for that accountability and feel as though we've all been given a a baton in the race and we need to run with it. Well, take that Bible again this morning and open it back to the book of James as we want to come back to that argument that James has been giving us in chapter 1, and, uh, and I want to just continue on in it and trust that it will be a blessing to you, a reminder to you to be a doer of the Word. But you remember, James said there in one nineteen, this you know, my beloved brethren, but let everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. For the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God, therefore putting aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness and humility, receive the word implanted, which is able to save your souls. But prove yourselves doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves. You can stop right there. Remember that we said last night, just a bit of review for you to run us kind of into the context, that the theme of James is these tests of living faith. That first, faith is tested in trials, verses 2 down through 12. Then it's tested in temptation in 13 through 18. And then thirdly, it is tested in what we said, hearing and receiving and obeying the Word of God in 19 through 27. And we clearly took the time last night to show you that the theme in this section is the Word of God, namely to hear it, receive it, and obey it. And so I, we, we looked at that uh, three distinct responses to God's Word. And we looked at the first two last night to hear His Word. And we said you must be quick to hear And again, it's talking about the Word. Slow to speak, that would be against the Word or against the character of God. 
And then we noted thirdly there under that opening point on hearing God's word, slow to anger. And then we moved over to our second principle on receiving God's word. And very importantly, we said that to receive God's word, something needs to be removed, okay? Something needs to be received, and then something needs to be restored. I don't think it's hard to see it in the exposition. What needs to be removed is that idea of filthiness and where it says there in verse 21, and all that remains of wickedness. Now, it's interesting when, when you look at that aspect of just something being removed. The main verb in verse 21 is the, in the sentence is the idea of to receive, okay? And because of that verb, as well as the related participle, putting aside, are in what we call the aorist tense. Now, this might not make sense to you, but I'll explain it, okay? The action of the participle is understood to precede that of the main verb. In other words, putting aside of sin is a condition for receiving the word implanted. And so if you just heard what Ken said, here's where that comes in. You cannot receive the word implanted until you put aside or take off all that remains of filthiness and wickedness. A man walked up to me this morning in between the time and he just said, do you think it's okay after I heard your message last night that I repented? And I said, oh, absolutely, we should be repenting every day, should we not? I mean, when we see those things in our life, when we see a cold heart towards God or a wrong view towards God or there's anger in our heart or bitterness toward God or someone else, then we have got to set those things aside in order to receive the Word of God. In fact, you learn this as a pastor. I remember years ago sitting down with a young man who came to me and told me that he was struggling with homosexuality, the sin of homosexuality. And I took at least a couple hours with him to walk him through the Scripture and to show him God's design for a man and God's design for a woman. And I remember kind of getting to the edge of that two-hour conversation and pushing him towards obedience and talking about removing sin, setting sin aside, and walking in obedience to the Word of God. And I can still remember it. I can still see the room that I was talking to him in as I was counseling him. He got up from the chair and literally ran out. It would be like running out of those double doors. The door flew open, and I have never, ever seen him again. And I, and I thought to myself, wow, I was just sitting there. And then I, I realized that word could never be implanted in his heart until he deals with his sin, right? So there was a lot of conversation going on for two hours. It helped me speed up my conversation. Now to ask, listen, do you want to be obedient to what the word of God says? Because until somebody's willing to set that aside, then they can't hear in our outline, receive that word implanted, which is able to save your soul. And so we finished last night that when you do receive that word, it is able, verse 21 there, to deliver your soul. And I take that to be to deliver it from a trial to deliver it from a temptation, to see your soul restored there again to the image of God. Now, as we come here now to our third principle in verse 22, we've got to hear it, the Word of God. We've got to receive the Word of God. But here, thirdly, we must obey the Word of God as the principle that He is driving us at. You've seen that statement before. We've got to obey God's word. But let me give you a let me give you just a little insight when you think of obey. I read this by in, in one of the, the writings in, that I've read recently. He said, Let, let's pretend that you work for me, okay? And you are my executive assistant in a company that is growing rapidly. 
and I'm the owner, and I'm interested in expanding my business overseas, okay? And I make plans to travel abroad and stay there until a new branch office gets established. I make all the arrangements to move to Europe for eight months, and I leave you in charge of the stateside organization. I will write you regularly and give you direction and instructions. Months pass, okay? And a flow of letters are mailed from Europe and received by you. Finally, I return. I drive down to the office, and I'm stunned. As I drive up to the office, grass and weeds have grown high. A few windows along the street are broken. I walk into the receptionist's room, and she's doing her nails. She's chewing gum. She's listening to a rap station. I notice that the waste baskets are overflowing, okay? The carpet has not been vacuumed for weeks. I ask about your whereabouts, and someone points down the hall and yells, I think he's down there. Disturbed, I move in the direction and bump into you as you're finishing a chess game with our sales manager. I ask you to step into my office, which has been temporarily turned into a television room for watching afternoon soap operas and highlights of Jeremy Lin, okay? <laughs> and I say, what in the world is going on, man? What do you mean? Well, look at this place. I mean, didn't you get my letters? Oh, yeah, sure. I got every one of them. As a matter of fact, we have a, had a letter study every Friday since you left. We have divided all the personal personnel into small groups and discussed many of the things you wrote. Some of those things were interesting. You will be pleased to know that few of us have actually committed to memory some of your letters, okay? Can you, and some of your sentences, and some of your paragraphs. One or two even memorized an entire letter. Great stuff in those letters. Okay, you got my letters, you studied them, you meditated on them, you discussed and even memorized them. But what did you do about them? Do? Uh, we didn't do anything about them. I mean, I wonder... I mean, such behavior is professional suicide. But how absurd and less absurd are we to hear God's word without the slightest indication to obey it? We memorize, but at times we fail to put it into practice. And what our Lord is going to do here now is task us through the writer of James to receive and obey this word. And I pray that we can follow its implications for us. Okay? So let's pick up the text in verse 22. Now as we walk through this, I'm going to give you an imperative to follow under obeying God's word, an illustration to understand, and then thirdly, an application to put into practice. Okay? There will be our way that we'll follow it. An imperative to follow, an illustration to understand, and an application to put into practice. But let's pick up first the imperative to follow. You see it there in verse 22. It says, prove yourselves doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves. Here's the imperative. Be a doer of the Word of God, which as Ken said this morning, is likened to obeying the Word of God. Now, most of the Jews of Jesus' day regularly heard the law. They regularly heard the prophets read and expounded in the synagogues. And they were, but they were content, many of them, only with the hearing and only with what we might call a superficial compliance to the Word of God, they really had very little desire to obey these words. I mean, to be a hearer only without obedience, you can see it there in verse 22, is to deceive yourself, is to be deluded is the word. In other words, deception is to be blinded to the reality of your true religious life. In other words, you can think you're spiritual and not be. If you're only merely hearing and you don't obey, then you have 
deceived yourself. We know that. In other words, if your conduct and your actions do not match your profession, then you are deceived, is what the Word of God would declare for us right there. I think we, we understand that, okay? We can all be deceived in a number of ways. I was thinking that I was deceived as a young man. I was actually dating my wife, Patty, right here. We weren't engaged, and it was Christmas time, and I had to give her a gift, and I was walking in an automotive store. Um, which I wasn't going to get her a gift there, but I'm walking into the store... <laughs> I had to fix something on my car. And as I'm walking in, this guy from kind of a lowrider car, as I'm moving towards the door, he goes, psst, psst. I look over, and he kind of catches my eye, and I kind of look at him, and I wasn't sure if he wanted to talk to me. He goes, come here. Me? Yeah, you. Shh, come here. And I come over, and I come over to his car, and I, you know, I, don't do this, young man. I come over, and I thought, for all I know, he could have had a gun and just, you know, just drilled me. He goes, I got something for you, my man. I said, what do you have? <laughs> and he's got this newspaper in his lap, okay? And he, and he peels back the newspaper, I'm kind of looking over, and he's got this jewelry, it's three weeks before Christmas. I go, wow, that's pretty nice. He goes, oh, it's really nice. This necklace here, 14 karat gold, goes for, how much would that be worth? A lot of money, wouldn't it? He goes, it, for you, he goes, $800. I said, oh, I don't have that kind of money. I'm just going into the automotive store, you know? He goes, listen, you can't pass this up. You got a girl in your life? I said, well, as a matter of fact, I do. He said, well, this necklace for 800 but for you, my man, $80. <laughs> I said, really? I go, are you sure that's 14? He goes, genuine 14 karat gold. And I reached into my pocket and... All I had was like 25 bucks. I said, man, all I got is 25 bucks. He goes, for you, my man, sold. I said, are you sure? So he, I buy it from him, oh, you know. But I thought, I didn't want to be foolish at that point. So I go to the mall that day. I'm not going to give that to my girlfriend at that point. Okay, so I go to the mall, and I go into this store called Zales, Okay. You know where you go and they got the lights coming down and the black, you know, felt down on the bottom and all the diamonds sparkling. I, and I'm walking up, I can still see myself walking up to the counter and I reach in to grab that necklace out of my pocket. I said, I'd like to know if this is real. And right about the word real, as I pulled it out of my pocket, she goes, no, that one's fake along with all the other ones that have been brought in. <laughs> I thought my man lied to me, you know. He said, who were you giving this to? I said, I was going to give this to my girlfriend for Christmas. She said to me, and she showed me with that little light, you see, this is not real. This is not, you were deceived. She said, if you put this on her neck within a month, it will turn green, you know. I said, you're kidding. She goes, no, I want to be really honest. You were deceived to purchase that. And you might ask, what did I do with that? Well, Christmas was coming, and I gave it to my sister for Christmas, okay? Just wrapped it up. I said, Tracy, we love you. And, uh, you know, we, we can look back, and we can, we can laugh. I laugh. That was what happened, and I was deceived out of, I don't know, 20, 25 bucks. But you would understand on a very serious level. I mean, could you imagine being deceived, though, about your ultimate salvation? I mean, you talk about deception. We can move on past that, the illustration I told, but you can never move past for Jesus to say, you, you know, be gone from me. I never, what? Knew you. You who practice
lawlessness. So here James opens up on this thought and he says, you have an, an imperative to follow. You must be a doer of the word of God. If you are not a doer, in, which is likened to obeying the word of God, then you have deceived yourself. Now there would be a question that could be asked here in the text is when you look at that, is it talking about a believer or is it talking about an unbeliever? I mean, is James actually saying to a believer, you'll become self-deceived or could he be talking to people who are in this particular flock and they're they're in the flock, but they're not really doing what they hear, and they have deceived themselves ultimately with the teaching of the Word of God. And I like to say, if the shoe fits, you need to wear it. I, could, I think that James could be addressing both people. He could be addressing a believer who needs to make sure that they become a doer of the Word of God. But it could be that people who are in that flock think they're a believer, but they're not really a believer, and they have ultimately deceived themselves. But I think here, when you look at this exhortation in verse 22, I think he's really trying to encourage you. I think he's saying to us, even this morning, prove yourselves to be a doer of the word of God, and he's admonishing us. Now, obviously, when you look at the collective teaching of the scripture, the scripture would build out the analogy of faith, and you find this in other places. Look over in 1 John chapter 3. Let me show you some text there. And these texts would be very clear that if you're not doing the Word of God, then you don't know God Himself. In fact, it's very clear in 1 John chapter 3, in verse 10 there, do you remember when the Apostle John said this? And let me just remind you of some of these scriptures. By this, the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. How so, John? Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor the one who does not, what? Love his brother. In other words, if you do not practice righteousness, John is very clear, you're not of God. Now the key there doesn't mean that we're not going to stumble, we're not going to um, we're not going to be perfect. We understand that. But John uses that idea of practicing righteousness. If you're the pursuit of your life, if the direction of your life is not towards righteousness, you're not of God. In fact, Jesus declared this in John 15, 14. He said there, you are my friends if you do what I command you. In other words, to be a friend of the Lord Jesus Christ you do what he commanded. In fact, Jesus said in John 14, 23, if anyone loves me, he will keep my, what? Word. If you really love the Lord, you're going to keep his, his word. In fact, look back at 1 John chapter 2, 1 John verse 3. You know these scriptures. It says there, by this we know that we have come to know him, how John, if we keep his, what? Commandments. So in other words, one of the ways that you're going to have assurance to know that you're really in the faith is when you keep his commandments. Again, not to perfection, but to the direction of your life. In fact, look at 1 John chapter 2, verse 4, where it says, The one who says... I have come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a what? Liar and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word in him, the love of God has truly been perfected. And so here, there's these scriptures, the correlation of all of the scripture, that you need to prove yourself to be a doer of the word so you're not deceived. Deceived ultimately to think that you're in the kingdom, but not. I mean, would it not be the most frightening day in those words of Matthew that everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will not enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. 
Jesus said, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out many demons and in your name perform many miracles and then I will declare to you, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. And so there is a sense here in James, it's kind of hard to know where he's coming in to exhort you as a believer or where some have come into the flock and think they're believers and they're truly not, we trust the Spirit of God's application in this. But I run into people like this, as you do all your life. I've known people. I've played college basketball um, in Los Angeles, and I remember just trying to live the gospel out on that team. And about halfway into the year, Um, I found out that this guy also said he was a believer on my team. And it surprised me because I knew that he was in an open, impure relationship with his girlfriend. You get the picture. He's just like every other guy on my team, but he named Christ. So I remember coming up to him and saying, listen, he was the center on our basketball team. Not the center, but the center. He was a big guy. And I walked him through the scriptures that the marriage bed is to be undefiled, that this is the will of God, that you abstain from immorality, um, that you be holy. And I began to show him the scriptures. I said, how could you name Christ but walk in a continual pattern of disobedience at least, at least at this time with this girl? Now, this is a guy that went down to church in Los Angeles. I knew exactly where he went, that pastor whom he went to is still preaching and peddling his false doctrine even this day. I said, are you a believer? He said, I'm a believer. I said, well, then what do you do with this sin of immorality with your girlfriend? And and I'll never forget what he told me. He said, quote, I just do my sin and then I confess it. I said to him, oh, I get it. You mean Jesus Christ is like a credit card for you. You, you get to go to heaven, and any time you commit that kind of fornication, you just use that credit card for almighty forgiveness. Now, I, I exhorted him. I said, listen, you need to see if you're really in the faith, right? I can't see inside that man's heart. Don't know if this was a momentary time, but I said, listen, Paul would say, examine yourself to see whether you be in the faith. And I think there's truth here. When you look at the, in James, when he writes, he would exhort us to be a doer of the word, Because if you're not obeying the word on a practical level, then you are going to deceive yourself. Either you're going to miss the blessing as a true believer, or in the ultimate deception, you don't even know him. I'm thinking of Jesus in Luke 6 when he said, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? He said, everyone who comes to me and hears my words, as Ken said this morning, and acts on them, I will show you what he is like. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid a foundation on the rock. And when the flood occurred and the torrent burst against that house, it could not shake it because it had been well built. But the one who has heard and not acted upon it accordingly. It's like the man who built a house on the ground without any foundation and the torrent burst against it and immediately it collapsed and the ruin of that house was great. So listen, you've got to hear the word and respond in obedience as a pattern of life or you will know the most ultimate deception. So here in the flow of the argument of James as you think on that, What James is saying is this, hearing is crucial, receiving is absolutely crucial, but hearing and receiving must be accompanied by obedience, or you and I are deceived. And so the Bible calls us to a response. We must do what it says. And that's just the clear picture. I remember working at a grocery stores, I was working my way through seminary and I was praying for a particular employee that worked in the bakery. And um, I thought, we need to pray for this girl. Because I remember her lifestyle and a few of the believers at our workplace were praying for her. And one day I'm 
in that bakery. I was taking a break. I was a checker. And I, I went back and I, I went to the wall and I was getting a drink from the Coke machine. And she's over here talking, making some kind of cookie or some kind of cake. And I, I overhear her talking and I knew of her lifestyle. She had left her husband, had a, two little, a two-year-old little boy and was already seeing another guy in, at the workplace, okay? And I overhear, as I'm getting this drink, I overhear her tell another person in the bakery, she says, I'm a Christian. And I, I was like this. She probably couldn't see me. I was like, <laughs> and, and I didn't want to let that go. So I walked over to her and I said, what did you say? She said, I'm a Christian. I said, you're a Christian. I said, how could you be a believer? She says, well, Scott, I, I'm a Christian. She said, I'm just not like you. And I was kind of like, like me, like there's some Superman on my chest, you know, or something. I, I'm thinking, all we're talking about here is one-on-one with Jesus, right? I said, what do you mean you're not a Christian, but you're not like me? Here's what she told me. Quote out of her mouth, I'm a Christian, but I just don't practice it. And I said, Ann, you can't know the Lord. I said, if you know the Lord, then he'll, he'll, he'll be operating in every sphere of your life. And your greatest joy will be to obey him and to love him. You won't do it perfectly. And you're saved by his grace. But in your heart, you'll want to love him even more. And, but this is how people look at it, do they not? They somehow think you could just come into a church, you could be in a Sunday school, you could raise your kids in in a class. But listen, if your hearing and your receiving is not accompanied by obedience, then you have deluded yourself. In fact, look at Paul's argument. Just look at this text in Romans. It couldn't be said any clearer here by Paul in his epistle to the Romans. In Romans chapter 2, verse 13 where Paul said there in 2.13, very clearly, it is not the hearers of the law who are just before God, but the, what? Doers of the law will be justified. That's an interesting phrase because we all know we're saved by grace. We all know that we're not saved by our works, but what Paul is unpacking is the doctrine of true justification that, it, that declares one righteous in the sight of God, but that true justification always leads to a life of sanctification. In fact, the Apostle John said it this way, little children, let us not love with word or with tongue, but in deed and in truth, okay? Okay? So there's the imperative. This is to us, even this morning, as Ken said, from the word of God, a very word from God, that we need to be proved to be a doer of the word and not merely a hearer who has deceived himself. Now, in order to explain the exactness of this imperative, James provides us secondly with an illustration. Okay? So an imperative to follow is now followed secondly by an illustration given. And we understand it. James is, uh, he's understandable. He says in verse 23, here's the illustration. If anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror. For once he has looked at himself and gone away, he's immediately forgotten what kind of person he was. But the one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty, and abides by it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer, this man will be blessed in what he does. And so James just in this illustration says, consider the mirror. And he illustrates his point with an example of the wrong behavior set side by side with an example of the right behavior, okay? The, the first example is the wrong behavior of hearing and not doing. Here in that first example, a man looks, but he goes away, he becomes a forgetful hearer, and he's deluded himself in verse 22. The second example is the pure one. He looks intently, he abides. He becomes an effectual doer, and then he's blessed. Blessed. 
Now, the mirror here in James is the Word of God. And the Word of God is likened to a mirror in that when you hear what it says, you discover, discover your faults. And therefore, you should go on, live differently, repent, confess, and you move greater towards Christ-likeness. And just as the natural mirror reflects our appearance, the Word of God gives an accurate picture of ourselves. I mean, we would seldom go out into public without looking at ourselves in the mirror, nor, listen believers, should we hear the Word of God without acting upon what we hear. Now, just technically, most commentators desire to make the difference between these two illustrations as one making a hasty glance, that's the man with the mirror, and the other man having an intense gaze, that's the believer with the Word of God. However, I would say to you honestly, both looks are equally intent on what they're looking at. In fact, in verse 23, when it says there in James, for if anyone is... is a hearer of the word and not a doer. He's like the man. And then it says this, who looks. That's the Greek verb katneo. And it's looking with consideration. It's actually looking with reflection. And in verse 25, likewise, where it says, but the one who looks intently, okay, uh, likewise, that is looking at the perfect law, each is equally serious in his gaze. I don't think it's the look that's the crucial part here, okay? It's what happens next that's the key to the understanding. The man, if you will, in the mirror goes away and he immediately forgets what kind of person he was. In other words, that man in the mirror in the first illustration is unresponsive. He's inactive to the Word of God. When he goes away, the language is in what we call the perfect tense and as he goes away, it emphasizes the continuing and sustained state, if you will. He goes away and he remains that way, okay? And so this is what we need to also look on. As Ken was preaching this morning, we need to make sure that we're hearing. We need to make sure we're receiving. But we also need to make sure that we are obeying, Okay, it's very, very important that we follow in obedience to this and even in the context that we're obeying the Word of God in the face of our trials and our temptation. Okay, in fact, the one who looks and goes away is the individual in the midst of a trial and temptation. He forgets about God and His Word. But the second person, look at verse 25, who looks intently at the perfect law the law of liberty, he says, and here's his ex second example of hearing and doing. Now, you, you do see that, and I'm reading from the New American Standard. Look at verse 25. But the one who looks intently, uh, it's possibly a stronger verb. It's parakaito is the word. When it, when it speaks of looking intently, it's that word used, remember in John 20, 25, when John the Apostle ran to the tomb and it said that he stooped to peer into the tomb and stooping over, if you will, to understand here in this text the mind and the heart of God. It could be that this is careful attention and examination to learn the ways of God, to learn the wisdom of God in the midst of a trial. Now, you'll note here, he changes the description of the Word of God. Interesting. Look at it in verse 25. He says, you, you see in 23, if anyone is a hearer of the Word, he just calls the Word the Word. But here in 25, but the one who looks intently, he says, at the perfect law. Stop there just for a second. James shifts from the Word to the law. And I think it is because he wants to put before us God's Word that is a law. In other words, his law makes a demand upon his people. In other words, I think flowing in the context, God can not only be trusted in his character in the midst of a trial, but as you trust his word, his word is described as a perfect law. 
And believer, when you trust God's word as perfect, not becoming double-minded, you will understand that the perfect law is in reality, look at the description again in verse 25. He looks intently at the perfect law, and then he calls it the law of what? Liberty, I love that phrase. In other words, as you obey the word of God, listen, here's a promise. You will experience freedom from the bondage of sin, from the bondage of the temptation. So here is this one, not forgetting, not going away, but looking, if you will, at the perfect law, the command that comes from God, and though it does come from us, from him to us as a command, it is a law of liberty. You experience freedom. But the next phrase is key. Look again at the text in 25. The one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty, and what does it say? This is key. Abides by it. You said, what does that word mean, abides by it? It's a great biblical New Testament term. It's the ideal of to continue or to remain in the word of God. This is the feature that marks the crucial difference between the man in the mirror in 23 and 24 and the doer in verse 25. The doer gives full attention to the word of God and continues on with it. Okay? The first man's look involved some examination, but the second man is gripped by it, and he continues with it. There's what true faith really looks like. I'm thinking of the words of Jesus in John 8, 31. If you continue in my word, then you truly are, what? Disciples of mine. Listen, you've got to continue on the word to affirm that reality. Now, if you do that, if you stoop, gaze, grip, and continue in that law, that perfect law, that law of liberty, and you abide by it, and you're not, look at verse 25, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer, this man will be what? Blessed. I love that. As you submit yourself to the transforming power of God's word, the promise believer is that it will yield joy. It will yield freedom to you. It will be a blessing to you. I mean, this is the wonderful paradox of the gospel when it's obeyed, right? It's, I call it a paradox because you give up everything to gain the pearl of great price, but when you find the pearl, when you find the gospel, out of joy, you go out and sell what? All you had because you've got the pearl. So young people, listen, as you hear, as you receive, and as you obey, and as you abide by that word, you will be blessed. You will profit from the word of God. So here as Ken was marshalling out those Puritans, right, about the awesome responsibility of sitting under the word of God, I would say, why wouldn't you sit under it as much as you could? You see? Really what you ought to be, you ought to be here in the morning. You ought to be here at the night. You ought to be like my little 12-year-old twins. Listen, if you're having a tough time reading the Word of God, take them as an example. One of my little twins just read through the Bible in three months over the summer. She's in the Word of God. She's in the Word of God. I wake up and I see my son reading Grant Horner. You know that Bible reading plan he has, Tom? It's not for me. Grant Horner has this place, this Bible reading plan. It's gaining a lot of pickup from people. You read in 10 different places, 10 different chapters every single day. So that by the time you're done with a year, he's reading through the Word of God two to three times. And I see these tabs, but, he, but he's in the Word of God. Listen, you've got to be in the Word of God. You say, well, why should I be in the Word of God? You'll be blessed. Don't you want to be blessed? 
Oh, there's greater accountability, but you'd never want to turn away from the blessing, would you not? You'd never want to turn away from the joy. I'm thinking of, of, of Joshua, you know it. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it, how long? Day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it, for then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have what? Success. Listen, you'd be crazy not to pick up the Word of God. Listen, you say, well, Scott, do you, do you love the Word of God? Oh, I love the Word of God. I study the Word of God. I've been doing it like Tom for well over 25 years of my life, but I'm on, the, I'm on read through the Bible two-year program because I like to stop. I couldn't do what my son Johnny does, all those places. I like to stop, so I read through the Bible in two years, and then I read through Psalms every year twice and Proverbs every year twice, and it is a blessing. Listen, you say, why would you do that? I want to be blessed. I want to have joy. I want to experience freedom. I don't want to live in guilt. I want the word to cultivate in my heart. I want to be like the man in Psalm, don't you? In Psalm 1, how blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates what? Day and night. Listen, it, when you abide by the perfect law, by the, by the law of liberty, when you remain and continue in it, not becoming a forgetful hearer, but a effectual doer, you will be blessed in what you do. Jesus said in John 13, 17, if you know these things, you are blessed if you what? Do them. I mean, it could be, you know, just even as Ken was bringing that out this morning, you could say, I, I, don't, I wouldn't want the accountability uh, here in the Word of God. But listen, you don't want to live your life in ignorance because you won't be as blessed as much if you don't know the Word, right? So you want to hear as much as you can, and then as he instructed us today and as James is, then obey it. I'm thinking of Psalm 19, where the law of the Lord is perfect, restoring the what? The soul. You want your soul restored? then read His Word. Because if you read His Word and if you obey His Word, it will restore your soul. It will begin to fashion your soul and bring that joy back to your heart. I'm thinking of the psalmist when he said, the precepts of the Lord are right and it rejoices the heart. It fills us with joy and peace and happiness as we obey it. So the one here who obeys God's word, and here's the context, in the midst of trials, in the midst of temptations, understands the secret of a happy, fulfilled life. And here the blessing is the result of doing and the reward from God. His blessing is experienced now as well as into the future. I'm thinking of Pilgrim's Progress and that Wonderful little analogy, Bunyan described the magnificent mirror, do you remember that? That the shepherds of the delectable mountains showed to Christian and mercy. Here's what Bunyan said about this mirror. He said, now the glass was one of a thousand. It would present a man one way with his own features exactly and turn it but another way and it would show the very face and similitude of the prince of pilgrims himself. Yea, I have talked with those that can tell and have said that they have seen the very crown of thorns upon his head by looking into the glass. And they therein also have seen the holes in his hands and his feet and his side. And Bunyan said, the man who continues looking into the mirror of God's word sees in it things far more wonderful than his own face. He sees not only his filthy garments, not only the spots and stains of his life, he sees Christ, he sees in it Christ, the Christ of the thorn-crowned brow, the Christ of the cross, his Savior, whose blood cleanses him from all sin, end of quote. Bunyan's point is that when a person looks into the Word of God, he will see two things. He will see his own sin, and he will see the sinless Savior of the Lord. 
But you got to look into the word because Wearsby put it this way, that when the child of God looks into the word of God, he sees the son of God and he is transformed by the spirit of God to share in the glory of God. But you got to be in the word, don't you? And so here is this word that has been given to us by James. But I mentioned there were three points, right? There was an imperative to follow an illustration, if you will, that is given. But finally, and I'll just finish with this. I could really skip this, but this might be really, really convicting, okay? He thirdly gives you an application to put into practice. James provides the application. Look at the text, and there's three of them. I'll just give you one of them, okay? But he says there, he says in 26, (laughs) this is amazing, You say, well, how did this come in here? Listen, if anyone thinks himself to be religious and yet does not bridle his tongue but deceives his own heart, this man's religion is what? Worthless. Now, he refers to this man's religion or his religion, it says there, is is worthless. It, It refers to the external acts of religion. Could be public worship, could be the singing of hymns, could be partaking of communion, it could be teaching, it could be a Sunday school class, it could be an elder, it could be being a deacon, being a key servant. In other words, what James says, if you think you're religious, verse 26, huh, but do not bridle your tongue, your religion is what? Worthless. The bridle and the bit, remember back in, or in James 3, were the instruments by which a rider could control his horse. And James said there, if you control the tongue, you control the whole body, right? If you control the bit and the bridle on the horse, you can direct a giant horse to go whatever way you want to go. James says in chapter 3, if you control the tongue, you control your whole body as well. In other words, James says in this application here that true spirituality reveals itself in a controlled tongue. It's pretty convicting, isn't it? Because a truly religious father, a truly religious mother, a truly religious student, a truly religious teenager, a truly religious child will have a bridle over their tongue. And so I'm asking you this afternoon, this morning, do you have a galloping tongue? God might say to you in the midst of a trial, whoa, 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 whoa. Let me ask you, do you keep going? He nudges you to the right and and you pull up. He tells you to pull back and you maybe gallop. Listen, and I'm saying this to my own heart. If you can't control your tongue, pretty convicting, huh then you've deceived your own heart. In other words, you can go through the external motions of worship and be self-deceived, and your religion and my religion is bogus. See, a true test of religion is not our ability to speak, but rather our ability to control and check our speaking. Pretty convicting. You say, well, Scott, out of all of the illustrations James could have used, why the tongue? I mean, why does it follow right there on the next verse? Listen, it's brilliant. It's because the tongue and the use of it, listen, is the greatest demonstrable proof of what's in your heart, right? I mean, it gets no more religious than that. Our tongue is the great revealer. I mean, is this not especially true in the face of trials? (laughs) Especially true in the face of temptation. When under stress, the tongue is compulsively revealing. And one who fails to control their speech demonstrates that their religion, verse 26, is worthless. In fact, it's a kind of an interesting Greek term. It's the ideal of futile because it fails to bring the goal for which religion is intended. In the Septuagint Greek Old Testament, it was used of pagan idols and idol worship. In other words, your religion, however great the sacrifice, without the tongue bridled, is as futile as idol worship. Listen, 
Here's the connection between 26 and verse 22. Failure to bridle your tongue in your speech is to be a hearer only and a form of being self-deceived. It's pretty scary, isn't it? See, the real litmus test of your obedience, the real litmus test of my obedience to God's Word is not your presence at worship. It's the control of your tongue in the midst of a trial. Won't James go on to say that from the same mouth come both blessing and what? Cursing, my brethren, these things ought not to be this way. Patty, you've said that to me a few times, haven't you? She has. I mean, we can praise God on Sunday and then somehow in the midst of a trial we begin to speak too much. James will go on to say, with it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the likeness of God. Listen, it may be, it may be that the big sins are avoided, but the tongue remains full of deadly poison. Here's what Calvin said. Listen to this. He said, a man will steer steer clear of adultery, of stealing, of drunkenness. In fact, he will be a shining light of outward religious observance and yet will revel in destroying the character of others under the pretext, he said, of zeal. He said, this explains the bloated pharisaical pride that feeds indulgently on a general diet of smear and censor. Listen, if we really want to put our faith into practice James gives us an application and he says, how's your tongue? How about this one in Ephesians 4? Let no unwholesome word, what? Proceed out of your mouth, but only such a word is as good for edification according to the need of the moment that it will give grace to those who hear. I like what Kent Hughes said. He said, James does not mean that those who sometimes fall into this sin have a worthless religion. For he said, we're all guilty at all times. He said, but he is saying that if anyone's tongue is habitually unbridled, through though his church attendance be impeccable, his Bible knowledge envied, his prayers many, his ties exemplary, and though he considers himself religious, he deceives himself and his religion is worthless. Pretty convicting, isn't it? Letters? Oh yeah. Sure. We got every one of them. As a matter of fact, we had a letter study every Friday night since you left. We've even divided all the personnel into small groups and discussed many of the things you wrote. Some of those things were interesting. You will be pleased to note that few of us have actually committed to memory some of your sentences and paragraphs. One or two memorized the entire letter or two. Great stuff in those letters. Okay, you got my letters. You studied them, meditated, discussed, even memorized them. But what did you do about them? Do? Uh, We didn't do anything. May we not be guilty of having those letters in our lap right now and not obeying. Amen? Let's pray even this morning. Father, I'm so so, so thankful for the mirror on the one side of the blessed Lord Jesus Christ who died in my place for all of my sins. And when I stand before you in glory, we recognize the promise of Romans 8.1 that there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We rejoice in that. And yet, Father, we know as can articulate it, we will stand before you and give an account of our stewardship. And I pray that we would monitor it well. I pray even this morning as we just looked at one of those, that as James seeks to apply what he's just taught, he does it with the tongue because the tongue may in fact be the greatest thermometer of our spiritual condition. Not our knowledge, not our degrees, not our years of experience, but how we speak to one another. Lord, would you help us be like the Lord Jesus Christ, who never reviled in return, that while he was being reviled, he uttered no threats,
but kept entrusting himself to the one who judges righteously. Oh Lord, put a guard over our mouth. And help us be a hearer of this word. Father, if there's any here who have deceived themselves in an ultimate way and they're convicted, then bring them to the Savior even now in repentance to the foot of the cross to cling to Christ, to recognize His work on their behalf, to recognize His death, resurrection, His ascension into glory that they might walk in the newness of life. Lord, for many of us who know You, may it just be a great check for us to continue ever to walk in obedience. Lord, thank you that you've given us your spirit to accomplish what you've asked us to do. Father, I pray that we would walk in dependence upon you, obeying your precious word, hearing it, receiving it, and obeying it, that we might gain the blessing of walking in joy in the fullness of life. This we pray in Christ's name. Amen.